Hello, my name is Bill Handirango, and I am a co-founder of Jacob's Ladder Africa and also the CEO of Great Carbon Valley. The reason I'm interested in climate is for several reasons. One, I do think, I do believe that it's one of the core defining um, challenges of our generation. Um, we think about Africa, we see what it, you know, the effects that climate is having, both in terms of jobs, livelihoods, um, ability to, you know, to grow food. Um, and we already have a lot of issues as Africa. And so on top of that, when you add climate, um, it definitely is a challenge that we, need, we, cannot, we definitely cannot ignore. But then there's the silver lining to all this, which is, for some reason, Africa stands at the vanguard or is actually stands at the vanguard of being able to provide solutions to climate. And so being able to look at that and seeing, you know what, we can actually create solutions for climate, creating livelihoods, creating jobs, but at the same time helping the world, helping the world decarbonize and solve for climate. Well, the story that the numbers are telling when you look at um, the current emissions is several fold. One, it's not going down. Um, so for a while now we've been emitting anything between 50 to 58 gigatons of carbon dioxide every year. Um, and that's on top of what's already been emitted and hasn't been um, taken in. Um, and we know this increasing efforts in terms of how much, you know, how much carbon is being removed or how much we are looking to um, reduce in emissions. But there are several factors that are playing against that. One is um, we have more and more people looking to industrialize and develop their, you know, um, increase their quality of life. And what does that mean? It means more buildings, it means more transportation, it means more food being grown. So the fact that you have people getting richer, and especially in developing countries, uh, it means that emissions will be going up, um, coupled with the fact that we have a growing population, especially in Africa. Um, and as is known, uh, we, have about, we have a main age of about 19.9 in Africa and only growing younger. And so the way to think about these numbers is these are young people that will soon grow up and begin to make certain demands for their lifestyle. So whether it's buildings, um, cars, um, food. And so in many ways, unless, anything, unless something is drastically done, emissions will only go up. And um, what this means for Africa is um, a couple of things. One, um, if we do nothing else, Africa will actually continue to be on the rise. In as much as right now, Africa only emits about 3% of global emissions, it's likely that it could actually increase in terms of the, you know, the amount of emissions we produce because we have a growing population. But there's a silver lining to that again in the sense that Africa can um, choose a different path as far as carbonization is concerned. So remember the reason why we are where we are is because there's lots of countries that have grown um, in an industrial, I've taken an industrial path that resulted in emissions being quite high. Um, because we are still at, I guess, the foundational stage of our development as a continent, we actually have the chance to make very different development choices. And so we're not saying that we do not grow, but the question is, can we grow differently? So can we have energy sources that are green? Can we start to build in ways that are green? Can we start to have mobility choices that are green? And because this is, we are, we're still at the investment stage, that, you know, Africa can and should look at finding ways to grow in a greener manner in a way that would actually make some of our countries become carbon negative, which means that we actually emit less than we, you know, um, than, you know um, than we're taking back in. Um, but of course, this therefore means um, there needs to be a conversation of what will it take to help Africa make those green investments and how much are we seeing efforts or conversations happening around um, green investments in a way that still allows for development and improvements of the quality of life, but at the same time in a way that is sustainable and um, uh, uh, plays towards decarbonization efforts globally. So there are different carbon removal technologies and in some ways typically broadly um, categorized between natural removal or nat nature based removals and um, technical removals and all of them have a play a part to play um, but why for me I, I think in many ways i've chosen sort of to go the path of technical removals very much supporting all the efforts that are going into nature based removals um, and i think we, th we should be doing everything that we can um, to remove carbon whichever way whichever way possible um, but the reason why for me technical based removals become really interesting is one, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I, I reckon there's, a, there's always a drawing towards um, technical bits. But if you look at the latest IPCC report, um, it does indicate that carbon removals and especially technical removals are, have, are going to have to become, we cannot run away from them given the levels of emissions that we already are at. Um, even if we did everything else in terms of reduction, in terms of um, cutting, you know, mitigating our emissions, 
we are at a, we we are so far gone in terms of the emissions that we've pr produced that we have to remove carbon from the air. Um, well, Nature-based removals works well, but then again, remember there's a lot of pressure on the land, so we cannot plant as many trees as we think we can um, because there's you know growing population, and so. As I said, those need to continue, and we need to keep all the efforts going in terms of, uh, you know, forestation and all the other nature-based removals. But I think we find ourselves at a point where the only way to really innovate ourselves out out, out of um, um, green, green um, climate change is we cannot. We have to. We have to embrace um, technology, you know, technical removals. And there's interesting technologies that are coming up, and people are really putting their minds and thoughts to how to, you know, how to go about this. Um, we're looking at things like biochar. We're looking at um, you know direct air capture, and even within direct air, direct air capture, there's lots of interesting technologies that people are you know um, experimenting around. Um, and then, of course, there's a question around how we store the carbon, um, and still very nascent, um, but now starting to think about um, are there you know are, you know are there ways that you can store uh, carbon dioxide underground. Um, that, you know, in places where you have basalt formations and other type of formations that allow you know allow us to store carbon permanently, and of course this has been this, it's been studied for the last 10, 20 years. So there's lots of um, studies that show that this is safe and it's a it's a good way to store carbon permanently. Um, and I think this, that's the other point to make around um, technical based removals is the fact that they actually offer us a chance to do permanent carbon removals. What I mean by that is if you think about uh, when you look at some of the nature remove uh, nature based removals things like planting trees while important um, if you cut down the tree then that's the end of that you, you know you, it, that tree that has been storing all this carbon begins to release the carbon and that offers us carbon removals for quite you know for, for a period of time but then that comes to an end we need to figure out are there, you know what's what are ways that we actually permanently remove carbon from the air and in some instances um, technical removals actually offer us the you know the one chance to do that so um, the other bit I will say around technical removals is, and at least I'm looking at this from the lens of being an African and trying to provide jobs, is that it's actually a novel way to provide um, jobs for our growing, you know, our growing population. It's a new technology. It's new technologies. Um, Africa has a chance to take up these technologies while they're still very new um, and actually develop and keep growing them. And there's really no reason why we should not be seeing students in our universities um, developing new methodologies around these technologies um, so such as improved sorbents for you know direct air capture like um, are there ways that we can inc you know utilize our geothermal power or our other resources to to to, you know, to improve how direct air capture is happening so when i look at how much technology can or you know can be done um, i see opportunities for young people to grow thrive and actually become the engineers that you know um, develop and implement some of these solutions So as to the issue of the green economy and opportunities for young people in Africa, it's quite immense um, for several reasons. One, it's as new as it gets, um, and unlike other industries, so when you think about how Africa has tried to develop, in many ways, it's always been about catching up with what other countries are doing. But the green economy is, offers us a, a chance in a lifetime whereby we are, in a sense, we are all at the same page, and it's it's anyone for the taking as it were so any country can decide you know what we are going to be green and we're going to develop our economy in a green way um, secondly when you begin to look at the um, some of the uh, policies that are coming up especially in the eu and to some extent the north and um, the global markets the global north um, there's a big push towards green manufacturing or just going green so again there will be a lot of in, in, you know increasingly there's going to be um a search for you know where, where where do you have green energy coming up? Where can you actually um, install green manufacturing? Thirdly, when you look at the resources that are required for the green revolutions, whether it's critical minerals um, or the you know um, or just minerals, yes, the minerals that are required for some of these technologies, a lot of them sit and lay in Africa. Um, and lastly, we have the land, we have the you know we have the energy, the resources, and the talent pool that's required for the green economy to to um, to thrive. And so when you t we take all these things into account, um, Africa can and should look at itself and say, OK, we have all these different resources. How do we position ourselves to make sure that we are the forefront of saying this is what the green economy looks like? This is what we offer as a continent, both in terms of resources, natural materials, but also talent. Um, and we can and should become the next manufacturing hub of the world um, from a green perspective. And, but this cannot happen just by us sitting and waiting for this to happen because remember other countries are also looking at this and seeing the opportunity. Um, so there has to be a deliberateness and um, a real 
intentionality about how we go about this. And there are several things around that. So one, do we have the right policies that attract um, green manufacturers or just people in the green economy to come into the continent? Secondly, are young people aware? Like, you know, we could be saying there's something called the green economy, but what's the awareness level amongst our young people? Are they aware? Do they even know there's something like that? Um, I mean, I, I'm reminded recently of a, of a, I'm reminded recently of a, on, um, a conference that I attended, and it was interesting to listen to a young Kenyan engineer who's working in a direct air capture company saying that up till when she was graduating, she had never even heard of direct air capture as a technology. Thankfully, someone came and spoke about it, and she was intrigued, and she's now working in one of those companies. Um, but I wonder how many of those kinds of really brilliant minds are sitting in our you know, universities, our tertiary education systems, or even in high schools, but don't even know there's anything called the green economy. So I think that's the starting point, which is let's begin to create general awareness. Let's make sure that they know that these are careers they can begin to grow into. At the same time, what's the training that's required? So what are employers looking for? Um, then as much as we are pushing for things like green ammonia, green hydrogen and, you know, and such, um, are engineers ready? Do we have the right kinds of engineers? Do we, do we have the right, the, num the, num the number of technicians that are needed for solar installation? So it's vast when you begin to think about the different ways that this could go into. Um, but there needs to be a deliberateness in terms of our training um, for the young people. So I think uh, rightfully so. So it's about policy regulation and creating the right environment, creating the right awareness amongst our young people, ensuring that our curriculums are actually um, responding to that and finally working with employers to see what do they need and how do we make sure that we are creating the you know apprenticeships and trainings for young people and so that we make sure that there's this linkage between industry and young people as it were. So Africa is a very low emitter and there's a question of um, should we push towards what's the balance between growth uh, versus the push towards becoming green? And is it unfair that we're being forced to go in a green pathway where also the countries have developed um, in a different manner? That, um, so the way I think about this particular question or this particular um, debate point is, uh, one, we're already where we are. It's unfortunate. And it's not as though climate change only affects the people that emitted the carbon dioxide. If anything, unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of the effects of, of climate change affecting Africa directly. Uh, as um, Kenya, for example, is still on the throes of maybe the worst drought in the last 40 years. You're seeing flooding happening in different countries on the continent. Um, and so whether we like it or not, um, we are where we are because of climate change. And we cannot say, we can't remove ourselves from the fight because we are still part of the same globe. And so the first point for me would be, we need to do whatever it takes to reduce climate because it's affecting us and affecting us um, um, negatively and even more so Africa that's a lot less resilient. Um, the second question, the second bit um, around that, and I think this is where the conversations around funds for um, loss and damage, and I think when you think about the last COP, um, where there was a big push towards creating that fund, um, I think it's only fair that there is some semblance of making whole as it were. And I guess you can never fully do it, but how do you make countries that didn't really play a role in the climate uh, issues that we face today um, become a lot more resilient, or at least be a lot more prepared to face whatever it is that's happening as far as um, you know, increased droughts, increased um, flooding, and, and so forth. So there's definitely, there, I think there has to be that conversation, and a real conversation, and not just conversation, but action towards helping countries become more resilient and ensuring that those funds um, exist. But when it, and when it comes to this question around how do we develop, um, I think we can look at it in, in a couple of ways. One is, yes, there may be a push towards um, let's utilize our fossil fuels, let's utilize um, all these different things that we have to, that you know, that it fuels as it were, to develop. Um, but I think countries have to be quite, quite careful about how they play this. And there's nothing wrong necessarily. I mean, one could say we need to use this to make money. Um, but I think there's some interesting um, policies that could come to play, which is why don't you, if, if you if say you're um, pushing or using your fossil fuels, why don't you ensure that the revenues that are received um, 
are used to develop a greener economy. Because remember, you don't want to build out infrastructure for fossilized fuels that will not necessarily be useful in another 20 years when the world has fully gone green. And we need to be quite clear around where the world is going. Um, if, we wanna be, if we want to become the manufacturing hub of the future, um, do we want to be stuck with assets that no one is going to use because they no longer want, you know, they, we have too much carbon footprint. So for countries that have fossil fuels, my suggestion would be if you already have those and you're already um, utilizing them, why don't you take the revenues from those um, resources to make your economy greener? And then for countries such as Kenya such, that are already green as it were, I mean, uh, our green is, you know, the grid in Kenya is about 93% green. We're already on a pathway that's green and it's going to probably be easier for us to raise funding um, to develop infrastructure in a greener manner because the world is moving away from non-green investments. So even in terms of raising funds and ensuring that we have um, investment um, infrastructure funds, um, why don't you take advantage of the fact that it's going to be a lot easier in, in this current environment to do green investments. But for me, again, it's looking at this from a 5, 10, 20, 30 year horizon where we build the industries of the future such that we will actually be the provider of choice when it comes to green investments or green manufacturing or green jobs, um, as it were. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a delicate balance. And I think it's a question of each country being able to look at itself and seeing where we are on the development journey. Um, if we if we're already green, why don't we go even greener? If we already have fossil fuels, yes, we can utilize them to fund our development at the moment. But can we begin? There are ways we can begin to change such, certain things. How do we build our buildings? Um, are there ways, you know, how do we... Um, What's our, what's our mobili what are mobility choices? Um, can we begin to do e-mobility um, and those kinds of things so that you are, you're making choices that we are pushing you towards a greener, a greener future in as much as you're, you're utilizing resources that are coming from your fossil fuels. On the issue of the just energy transition plans um, and the questions as to whether this would lead to loss of jobs or what does this mean for um, people that are already working in um, carbon heavy industries as it were. Um, it's definitely not um, a very straightforward question. Um, of course there's been questions for, ex for example when you look at South Africa and the JETP plan there. Um, as you, um, South Africa as you know, as you may know is very heavily uh, coal, de coal dependent about 70% of the energy from South in South Africa um, comes from coal, um, coal mines. And of course, there's been questions of if we are going to push towards a greener grid, what happens to the coal miners? Um, and even if, for example, we do an energy transition, are the people that are going to be working in the green economy the same people that are going to be working, are the same people that are working in mines? And it's, it's not always a one-to-one -one correlation. It's not as though you can just take a coal miner and say, hey, please go and work in a wind farm. And so I think it's not a very easy question, but it's something that has to be um, looked into. I go back to the fact that um, we are going to, we cannot, we're already at a place where the world is going to go green. And so countries cannot ignore that. And any country that's looking at its 5, 10, 20 year plan should be looking at where is the world going to be in another 20, 30 years. So whatever investments you can make, um, and whether it's using external, you know, external investments or um, even your own internal investments, you need to make sure that you are investing towards a green future. And the good thing with that is that there will be jobs that will be created either way if we are deliberate about that. So if, say, we want to build a geothermal plant in Kenya or we want to, you know, um, harness, in, you know, wind potential in Namibia or, um, or hydro in Ethiopia, those are jobs. Um, and those are, you know, and, and of course people that are going to be working on those jobs uh, are young people ideally. And so that's a job that, that didn't exist that, you know, now exists. As to the people that are working in fossil industries, um, I don't think the fossil, you know, fossil industries will die tomorrow. You know, it's not, it's not, a, it's not something that uh, will not will stop existing in the next year or two. So you still have a couple of years where people will continue to be employed in these industries. But the, th the question is, how do you have a just way that either you're transitioning them to new jobs or helping them? Um, acquire other skills uh, or just providing them with a safety net of sorts that allows them to have to have a, have a softer landing as it were um, to go either into a new industry or to have to retire because their jobs have been made redundant and so yes I think there is a question about it but then again we have to remember that we have time um, in the sense that we are not shutting down these coal factories tomorrow um, there is you know there's several years for this to go on um, but the question is how do we take advantage of this window, that period of time to train the people that are already working in the coal mines or provide them with alternatives um, 
that they can take up once um, once a, once the mines have been closed. So the climate discussion needs to go beyond your activists or the people or your climate experts. So in, you know, for a while, it's kind of been seen that the people that discuss climate tend to be either scientists, climate scientists, or climate activists, or to some extent, government. Climate effect is affecting all of us. Um, we all have issues with drought, flooding, um, and um, and so forth. So. We cannot say that climate is, or is only a purview of certain few people. Um, it's something that is, that's cross-cutting and affecting all of us. And, for, and secondly, for us to really tackle climate, it will take people across multiple sectors thinking in a green manner. What I mean by that is, you start, I'll give an example. So when you look at um, climate and health, it's not something that people always talk about, but climate change is actually beginning to affect healthcare in very interesting ways. Um, whether it's we have to build hospitals that are now more climate resilient or drought resilient, you know, uh, or flooding resilient, um, or as you're starting to see um, more and more people getting affected by, you know, um, lack of food or that kinds of, you know, malnutrition because of, you know, climate change effects. Um, what, how does that then translate to um, a healthcare worker or a health provider. And so the fact that climate will, t for us to tackle climate, uh, both both in the, you know, in decarbonization efforts, but also in dealing with the effects of climate, you will note it, the fa it will affect across, it will affect people across multiple sectors. And it's important that um, people have a general awareness about it. Um, you don't necessarily have to be, to get into the weeds and the numbers and understand everything, but at least it's important that we begin to ask ourselves, how is climate affecting us? Um, and how is climate affecting us as a nation? And also this allows us to begin to push for the right policies. So are our leaders actually thinking the right way? Are we starting to hear politicians or policymakers discuss climate in the manner that we need to be discussing? Um, our children are going to grow up in a very different world than we grew up in. Um, they're going to have to grow up in a world where climate is the defining aspect of their generation. So climate technologies, climate reduction efforts. So from a very, from very early age, we need to begin to get our children really interested or at least understanding what climate um, is. And not from a place of gloom and doom, but I think more from a place of, yes, it's a challenge, but we can solve it. And how do we make sure that everyone is aware so that we are both making the right career choices for the young people, we're making the right policy interventions for people in those kinds of spaces. Uh, we're making the right economic decisions, um, depending on the sectors we are in. And, at this, and lastly, we are creating an environment that brings in the investments that are needed, but finds people that are ready for this. Um, and the discussions that need to be made and that need to be had, um, actually being had at a level that um, is a little bit more elevated and people know what it is that they need to talk about um, as far as climate is concerned. So I think I would say that Climate is affecting everyone, and the sooner we can all become aware of it and can begin to become smarter about our discussions, about it, make, demanding the right answers, demanding the right conversations, the right level of discussions, the better it will be for all of us.